This recording is chapter six, part one of two, bone tissue and the skeletal system. As we've previously discussed, the body can be broken down into two main portions. The axial portion, which is straight up and down from your head to approximately your crotch, and then the appendicular portion of your body includes your appendages, which are your arms and your legs. In the skeletal system, the axial division of the skeleton includes the bones of your skull and all the bones of your spine, including your neck, your thoracic area, the lumbar region of the spine, the sacrum, and the coccyx. The axial division of the skeleton also includes the rib cage and the sternum. The appendicular portion of the skeleton not only includes the bones of the arms and the legs, it also includes the parts of the skeleton that holds the arms and the legs to the rest of the skeleton. If we look at the appendicular skeleton, the pectoral girdle holds the arms to the thorax, the chest. The pectoral girdle is considered part of the appendicular skeleton, and it includes the clavicle, which you know is your collarbone, and the scapula. The pelvic girdle is the part of the appendicular skeleton that holds the legs onto the axial skeleton. The pelvic girdle includes the pelvic bones, which are made up of three different portions. We'll discuss those when we get to that specific bone. The skeletal system is not only important because it supports our body and allows us to move more efficiently, it also helps to protect internal organs. The brain and the spinal cord are entirely encased in bone and that is because those particular organs are extremely important to the proper function of our body. Bone also helps to produce blood cells. It also stores minerals and fat and can release those. When people talk about the fact that bone is where calcium is stored, if you remember I spoke earlier about the fact that calcium is stored in bone as a molecule known as hydroxyapatite, where it is combined with phosphorus. So calcium and phosphorus are stored together in bone as hydroxyapatite. Hematopoiesis is the formation of blood cells. This occurs in the red marrow in bone. You'll remember that red marrow is comprised of reticular connective tissue. And not only are red blood cells or erythrocytes produced by the red bone marrow, but also our leukocytes, which are white blood cells, which play a critical role in our immune system. In bone, there is also another type of marrow referred to as yellow marrow because it contains adipocytes. And as you remember, Adipose connective tissue with the adipocytes is where triglycerides are stored, so that can serve as a storage site for energy. Bone marrow is a semi-solid gelatinous material, again made up mostly of reticular connective tissue. It's also referred to as myeloid tissue. It's highly vascular, so it's got a good blood supply. And it also contains stem cells that we call mesenchymal stem cells. In adults, red bone marrow is primarily going to be located in flat bones, such as the sternum and the pelvic girdle. In children, it's also found in the medullary cavity of long bones, such as the femur. As people 
grow from childhood through adulthood, the ratio of red marrow to yellow marrow changes. Adults have more yellow marrow because yellow marrow is consistent of adipose connective tissue. So as people age, they get more adipose connective tissue and less of the red myeloid connective tissue. Here you can see in the top picture, in the center, there's a little bit of yellow marrow and that will continue to become more and more prevalent in people who age. The ratio changes as they get older. Interestingly enough, if a person has an injury which causes hemorrhaging and the person loses a lot of blood, the body will reconvert some of that yellow marrow into red marrow to help produce more blood cells. We've got 206 bones in our body that are categorized in to five different shapes. Most commonly people are familiar with long bones such as the femur. Long bones are characterized by having a long shaft with expanded ends. We also have short bones such as the tarsal bones in the foot and the carpal bones in the wrist. Flat bones are characterized as flat bones because they have a very flat feel to them. The sternum is a good example of a flat bone. If you've ever had the opportunity to feel one of the plastic rib bones in lab, you'll feel that it feels flat. The um, pelvic bones are flat. We also have irregular bones, such as the vertebra. Okay, here is one vertebra. If we made this plural and added an E to the end of this word, that would be vertebrae. And vertebrae are considered irregular bones. And the last type of shape of bone is sesamoid. The patella, which is more commonly what you may think of as your kneecap, the patella is shaped like a sesame seed, and that's where it got its name as being sesamoid, resembling a sesame seed in shape. In looking more closely at bone structure, we can see that the long shaft of this bone is referred to as the diaphysis. The expanded ends are each referred to as the epiphysis. If we wanted to talk about them collectively, we would say epiphyses, replacing the is with an es to make it plural. Because this bone is going to attach to the point of origin of the body at this end, that makes this the proximal epiphysis whereas this end is the distal epiphysis. It's farther away from the point of origin. Between the diaphysis and the epiphysis, you'll notice that there is the metaphysis. The word physis means growth. Metaphysis means a lot of growth. And that's where bone, when it was forming, had a lot of growth longitudinally. Between the metaphysis and the epiphysis, you'll notice the epiphyseal line. When bone was growing, that epiphyseal line was referred to as the epiphyseal plate. And that was where the growth was occurring. When growth is finished, it turns into what is known as the epiphyseal line. On the outer portion of the bone, we see a layer of dense irregular connective tissue that is called the periosteum. Peri means around, osteo means bone. 
So the periosteum is the dense irregular connective tissue around the bone. And the shaft of the long bone contains a cavity. You know that a cavity is a space. And the cavity of the long bone is referred to as the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is where we find marrow. Inside the medullary cavity is where we also see an inner lining referred to as the endosteum. You'll notice that there is spongy bone on the end of the bone in this picture. Bone comes in two forms, spongy bone, which is also known as cancellous bone, and compact bone, which is also referred to as cortical bone. We'll take a look at that a little bit more closely. Lying on the trabeculae of the spongy bone, we will also see the lining of the endosteum. We'll see that in a close-up view later. The flat bones of skulls contain a layer of spongy bone that has a special name. They refer to it as diploe. And the diploe is lined on either side by a layer of compact bone. Different bone markings have different names, and the markings found on bones serve different purposes. Some projections or processes, and by the way, anything that is a projection or a process is going to stick out those are often going to act as the site of muscular or ligamentous attachment. There are some projections on bones that help to form joints, such as facets and condyles. There are other bone mark markings that are either depressions or openings for uh, articulations to occur, blood vessels or nerves to pass through. And as you learn these names in lab, you'll become more and more familiar with them. It's really important if you're in a lab class to bring along a type of label that you can write the name of the marking for the bone out on the label and then gently stick it on the model where you can remove it easily. Please always use labels that can be removed easily and don't leave residue on the models. The process of writing out the name and physically sticking it on the model will help you learn the names of the structures that much more easily. Here we have some pictures of different bone markings. One of them that was not in the list that we just saw was fovea. A fovea is a small pit or depression. Capitus means head, and there is a small pit or depression in the head of the femur, which allows for nutrient arteries to penetrate. Here we have on the humerus a sulcus, which is a groove, and that's actually the intertubercular sulcus because there are are uh, two tubercles near the head of the humerus and in between there is in between the two tubercles is where you see the um, intertubercular sulcus there's actually a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle again you're learning these in lab it's really important to spend the time in lab to get your hands on these structures to label them to quiz your classmates and really work with these models. Here we have a picture of the skull and there are different structures. This is a nice picture of the skull because it shows the sinuses of the skull. We have the frontal sinuses in the frontal bone. Those are these. We have the maxillary sinuses in the maxillary bone. 
and then we have the ethmoid and sphenoidal sinuses. Let's take a closer look at the types of cells we're going to find in osseous connected tissue. We're going to start with the osteocyte. Osteocytes are mature bone cells that make up most of the cell population in bone. Each osteocyte lives in a lacuna, a pocket sandwiched between layers of matrix, and the layers are called lamellae. Osteocytes cannot divide, and a lacuna never contains more than one osteocyte. Narrow passageways called canaliculi penetrate the lamellae, radiating through the hard matrix and connecting the lacuna of one osteocyte with another osteocyte and also with blood vessels that are permeating throughout the osseous connective tissue. Canaliculi contain extensions of the cytoplasm of each osteocyte, and neighboring osteocytes are linked together. Their membranes are linked together by gap junctions, which allows the exchange of ions and small molecules and nutrients and hormones between the cells, so that even though the osteocytes are literally painted into the hard matrix, they can still communicate with one another very well, and they still have a good access to nutrients and oxygen and can get rid of the carbon dioxide and waste products by way of diffusion. Osteocytes have two major functions. They maintain the protein and mineral content of the surrounding matrix, which is a very dynamic process because there's a continual turnover of the components within the matrix. And osteocytes are going to secrete chemicals that will dissolve the adjacent matrix and minerals released and um, that will enter circulation in the bloodstream. Then the osteocytes rebuild the matrix. So they're continuously um, remodeling bone stimulating the de deposition of new hydroxyapatite crystals. And the turnover rate is going to vary from bone to bone. Osteocytes also participate in repairing damaged bone. If they are released from their lacunae, the osteocytes can actually convert to a less specialized type of cell, such as an osteoblast or an osteoprogenitor cell. The next type of cell we're going to look at is the osteoblast. Whenever you see the suffix blast, know that that is going to build, blasts build. And osteoblasts are going to produce new bone matrix in a process called ossification or osteogenesis. Osteoblasts make and release the proteins and other organic components of the matrix before calcium salts like hydroxyapatite are deposited, this organic matrix that is not yet calcified is referred to as osteoid. We'll take a closer look at that when we look at the formation of bone. Osteoblasts also assist in elevating local concentrations of calcium phosphate above its solubility limit, thereby making sure that calcium salts can be deposited into the matrix. This process helps to convert softer osteoid matrix into hard bone. So osteocytes develop from osteoblasts that have painted themselves into a lacuna by hardening the soft osteoid around them and making that matrix around them hard. So they kind of solidify that matrix around them. Bone contains small numbers of mesenchymal stem cells, 
referred to as osteogenic cells, or you might see this as osteoprogenitor cells. These are actually squamous stem cells that produce daughter cells that will differentiate into osteoblasts. And osteoprogenitor cells maintain populations of osteoblasts that are important whenever bone breaks or cracks. And they are located in the intercellular layer of the periosteum. They're also located in the endosteum, which is located inside the medullary cavity of bone and also um, on the spicules or trabeculae of spongy bone. This will take us into osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are found on bone surfaces and will be stimulated to remove and recycle bone matrix. They are really big cells. They actually have about 50 or more nuclei. As you can see in this picture, there's a lot of nuclei in that cell. And osteoclasts are derived from the same stem cells that actually produce cells involved in our immune system. They are derived from stem cells that produce monocytes and macrophages. So these are big eaters and they will produce and release acids and proteolytic, that means a protein digesting enzyme, okay, proteolytic enzymes, protein digesting, that will dissolve the hard matrix and release stored minerals. And this is a process called osteolysis, breaking down bone or resorption. And it's important in regulating the concentration of calcium in the bloodstream and body fluids. In living bone, osteoclasts are constantly removing bone matrix and osteoblasts are always adding to it. And so that balance between the opposing activity of osteoblasts and osteoclasts is very important because when osteoclasts remove calcium salts faster than osteoblasts deposit them, that weakens bone and sets up a condition known as osteoporosis, which is bone that's very porous. And that's something that can also be it can be regulated by hormones. We'll take a look at that in a future slide. This is just a picture of osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. Here on the left side, we can see the osteoblasts. These are building and secreting bone matrix the hard calcium salts. Here we have an osteocyte. It's a mature bone cell painted into and residing in its lacuna. You can see the canaliculi. That's the tiny canal that allows the cytoplasm of one osteocyte to communicate with the cytoplasm of another osteocyte. They are communicating by way of gap junctions. Here's a big osteoclast over here on the left. You can actually see some of the nuclei located in that osteoclast. Let's take a look at the structure of compact bone. Compact bone is sometimes referred to as cortical bone. There's another type of structure known as spongy bone. Spongy bone is also referred to sometimes as cancellous bone. We'll get to that in just a second. Compact bone is going to be found surrounding bones, whether they are irregular in shape or short or long. In long bones, the shaft of the long bone, the diaphysis, 
is where we find the thickest compact or cortical bone. Compact bone is very dense, very strong. It's found just deep to the periosteum. And again, in the diaphysis of long bones is where we find that it is the thickest. Compact bone is made up of structures referred to as osteons. An osteon resembles the trunk of a tree that has been sawed. Sometimes osteons are referred to as haversion systems, so you may see that term in your reading. Each osteon has a canal running the length of the osteon. That canal is lined with endosteum and is referred to as the central canal. The central canal is filled with blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels. Most illustrations don't include lymphatic vessels. As we can see in this picture on the top, there are blood vessels running in the central canals parallel to the length of the osteon, and there are also blood vessels and nerves running perpendicular to the length of the central canal. Those are referred to as perforating canals or Volkmann's canals. With all this blood supply going through the osteons, between the osteons, you can see how bone has a very good blood supply. The osteons have layers of lacunae where osteocytes reside. The layers of the lacunae are referred to as lamellae. That is plural for lamella. A lamella is a layer. So there are layers of osteocytes arranged in concentric rings around the central canal. You can see, if you look very closely at this picture on the top, that there are tiny little canals that connect the osteocytes to each other. Those tiny little canals are referred to as canaliculi. And that allows the osteocytes to communicate with the blood vessels in the central canal, as well as with those in the perforating or Volkmann's canals. On the left of this picture, on the top, we also see the periosteum. Remember, the periosteum is two cell layers thick. It has an outer fibrous layer, which will allow for attachment of tendons and ligaments and aponeuroses. There's also an inner osteogenic layer that will help with the production of bone. In between the osteons, there are other layers and the layers in between the osteons are known as interstitial lamellae. The layers around the compact bone surrounding the osteons are referred to as circumferential because they go around the circumference of the bone. Those are circumferential lamellae. Here's the other term I just mentioned, interstitial lamellae. So between the osteons, there are layers of interstitial lamellae. And around the entire shaft of the bone, we find circumferential lamellae. Looking at the structure of spongy bone, which is also referred to as cancellous bone, we see that 
there are no osteons. Instead, we have a lattice-like or lace-like network of bone spicules or spikes. And within the spikes, we see layers. Again, we have lamellae. There's just no central canal. So we still have the rings within these spikes. Here we have an osteocyte. Here we have another osteocyte. Here we have another osteocyte. And the osteocytes are still connected by those canaliculi. Those tiny little canals. But spongy bone is called spongy bone because it has these spicules or spikes of bone with lots of space in between the bone. So we have this lattice-like or lace-like network of matrix spikes that are referred to as trabeculae. These bony spicules are referred to as trabeculae. There is a lot of red marrow in between the spongy bone. Covering the spongy bone because it is inside a network is endosteum. Remember, we have endosteum on the inner portion of the medullary cavity of the shaft of the long bone, which we call the diaphysis. And we also have endosteum covering the trabeculae of spongy bone. Spongy bone is found in the ends of long bones as well as in between compact bone and flat bones. What happens when there's a problem with bone formation? Patchett's disease is a disease process that can occur most commonly in adults who are over 40 years of age. And it's basically a bone remodeling disorder where osteoclasts become overactive and osteoblasts try to keep up with the disintegration of bone, but the, they're laying down bone so quickly that they're not doing it properly. So the result is that there's a lot of thick, weak, brittle bone that's produced in an effort to compensate for the bone that's being resorbed by osteoclasts that it is just not able to function properly. Because this bone is weak and brittle and prone to fracture, we can see thickening as you see in the skull down below. You can see how the legs start to bow with Paget's disease. So in the picture of bone here, we see normal bone at the top and pagetic bone at the bottom. You can see the difference microscopically between the two. And oddly enough, and scientists do not understand why this occurs, it tends to affect the bones of the pelvis, the skull, the spine, and the legs most often. Again, the scientists don't understand why this occurs. They believe that it may be hereditary or it could be due to some unknown virus. We know that compact bone gets its blood supply and nerve supply through the central canal and Volkmann's canals, which are also known as perforating canals. Spongy bone and the spongy bone lining the medullary cavity are going to get their blood from arteries that pass through the periosteum and then through the compact bone, not just in the diaphysis, but also in the metaphysis and the epiphyses through holes known as nutrient foramina. And as blood passes through the spongy bone, 
remember that oxygen and nutrients will diffuse to the tissues and then carbon dioxide and waste products will diffuse into the small veins which are referred to as venules and then those veins will exit through the same holes that are going to contain the arteries bringing fresh blood into the bone. We know that nerves are going to follow the same pathway as I just mentioned and blood vessels and nerves are often going to be concentrated where there's a lot of metabolic activity. Nerves not only sense pain, they also play a role in uh, bone growth as well as the regulation of blood supply. Our skeleton actually starts developing prior to week eight in utero. There are two types of ossification processes that occur. One is known as intramembranous ossification because it's ossification that begins within a fibrous connective tissue membrane. That's what the word intramembranous means, within a membrane. Intramembranous ossification is responsible for forming the flat bones of the skull, the mandibles, and the clavicles. With intramembranous ossification, we can see mesenchymal stem cells that are going to differentiate into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are going to group into clusters forming what are known as ossification centers. These osteoblasts are going to start to secrete a gelatinous matrix around them that is called osteoid. As this process continues, more osteoblasts are formed from the mesenchymal stem cells surrounding the ossification center. These osteoblasts continue to secrete osteoid inward toward the ossification center. The osteoblasts that are inside the ossification center become trapped and mature into osteocytes. The trapped osteocytes are going to start secreting minerals to turn the osteoid into hard bone matrix. And what we're seeing with this picture in B is actually a cross section of a spicule of bone in picture C on the lower left. So as these spicules of trabecular bone begin to ossify, they will fuse together. They're growing around blood vessels that have been forming inside the membrane while all of this is going on. So they're growing around the blood vessels and forming spaces as they continue to develop and the spicules fuse together. You'll also notice that the osteoblasts around the ossification centers are also going to be differentiated from mesenchymal stem cells outside all of this trabecular bone. And the mesenchyme will also differentiate. Some of these mesenchymal stem cells will turn into fibroblasts, which will produce collagen fibers. So we see a periosteum being formed by the mesenchymal stem cells. The periosteum, you'll remember, is only two cell layers thick. There's an outer layer of periosteum, the fibrous periosteum, which again is made up of fibroblasts and an inner osteogenic layer, genic meaning producing, and that is made up of osteoblasts. Now the osteoblasts will persist throughout the life of the bone and they will have 
varying amounts of function depending on the stress placed on the bone and are responsible for bone remodeling throughout the life of the bone. And the osteoblasts will also help to produce and form layers of bone just underneath them. So they'll actually form layers of compact bone, which is also known as cortical bone. And you may also see the term lamellar, because lamella means layer. So the osteoblasts are going to continue to secrete and form layers of compact bone just underneath them and between them and the spongy bone. Now some of these blood vessels are going to get trapped inside the spaces of this growing spongy bone. And so that will trap the blood vessels and they'll start secreting um, bone marrow into those spaces to fill up the spaces of that spongy bone with bone marrow. So we're going to start seeing that whole area inside here being filled up with bone marrow. Some of the blood vessels will persist and communicate with the reticular connective tissue that is the bone marrow in these spaces. Because bone marrow is highly vascularized. And this is where hematopoiesis occurs. Hematopoiesis is the formation of blood cells, including erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, as well as leukocytes, which are white blood cells. So that's going to occur. This spongy bone will be filled with bone marrow. Now there is an excellent video where a gentleman, I believe he's from Australia because of his accent, talks about everything that I just discussed, only he draws it out and it's just brilliant. So I put that video on Blackboard in Chapter 6 under Video Resources. So if you go to Chapter 6 Video Resources, click on that link, it's the very first video. I moved it to the top of those video resources. And it's just intramembranous ossification, but it's fabulous. So I highly recommend that you watch that video. It's going to give you another perspective of this because he draws it out and it's different colors. It's really cool. This takes us to endochondral ossification. Endo means inside, chondro means cartilage. So this is pertaining to inside the cartilage. Endochondral ossification is going to produce all of the other bones in the body that aren't produced by intramembranous ossification. And the template for endochondral ossification is hyaline cartilage. Remember, hyaline cartilage is the most abundant type of cartilage in the human body. So we start with a model of hyaline cartilage that has to be turned into or transformed into bone because we don't want a skeleton made out of cartilage. We want a skeleton made out of bone. So let's look at the process of endochondral ossification. Let's take a look at the process of endochondral ossification. I'm going to take myself off of this picture so you can focus on the pictures on the screen. Endochondral ossification starts with mesenchymal stem cells differentiating into chondrocytes that form into a hyaline cartilage model. And we can see the hyaline cartilage model all the way over here on the left. The hyaline cartilage model and the perichondrium around it will form, and as that model of hyaline cartilage enlarges, those chondrocytes in the center of the shaft are going to increase greatly in size. And the matrix surrounding them gets reduced to a series of small struts that begin to calcify. Those enlarged chondrocytes begin to die off and disintegrate leaving cavities 
within the shaft of this cartilage. Now, blood vessels will actually grow around the edges of the cartilage and the cells of the perichondrium are going to differentiate into osteoblasts so that the shaft of the cartilage becomes enclosed in a superficial layer of lamellar or compact bone. So we get this lamellar or compact bone forming on the shaft of the hyaline cartilage. The next thing that's going to happen is blood vessels are going to penetrate the cartilage. We can see that coming in here. And as the blood vessels penetrate the cartilage and invade that central region, fibroblasts are carried in through these blood vessels and will differentiate into osteoblasts producing spongy bone at an area known as the primary ossification center. Now, when the capillaries penetrate the cartilage, that also stimulates the perichondrium to transform into the periosteum. And so we get a collar of periosteum forming with osteoblasts and fibrous connective tissue outside the lamellar compact bone that had formed on the outside of the cartilage. So we've got a primary ossification center where we have these osteoblasts producing spongy bone and bone formation is then going to start to spread in both directions along the shaft towards the ends. And remodeling is going to occur as growth continues inside the shaft, creating a medullary cavity. The osseous tissue of the shaft becomes thicker and the cartilage near the ends, which are the epiphyses, is going to be replaced by the shafts of the bone. And further growth is going to involve increases in the length and the diameter. So basically what happens in the primary ossification center is we have this breaking down of the cartilage that existed and laying down of spongy bone in the circumference of the space in this medullary cavity. Now, from here, we're going to notice that capillaries and osteoblasts are going to migrate into the epiphyses. Remember, the epiphyses are the expanded ends of long bones. And when these blood vessels permeate the epiphyses, they form secondary ossification centers. So we still have hyaline cartilage at the ends, but as the blood vessels come in, they are going to start to fill the epiphyses with spongy bone as the blood vessels bring in fibroblasts that are gonna differentiate into osteoblasts. And as this process continues, there is a cap of articular cartilage that remains on the very end of the epiphyses on both ends of the bone. And that's because that's the part that remains exposed to the joint cavity. So there's also an epiphyseal plate that is in existence between the diaphysis or the shaft of the long bone and the epiphysis. 
So we still have this area known as the epiphyseal plate where we're going to see longitudinal growth occur. What connects the primary and secondary ossification centers is the epiphyseal plate, which is made up of hyaline cartilage. So let's look at what happens at the epiphyseal plate. Longitudinal bone growth occurs at the epiphyseal plate, which is located between the metaphysis and the epiphysis. So on this particular picture, we can see the metaphysis down here at the bottom and the epiphysis which they don't really show you here, is at the top. I'm going to put E for epiphysis. Now remember, this is made out of hyaline cartilage. So within this hyaline cartilage, in one of the areas in the epiphyseal plate, we have what is known as the reserve zone. The reserve zone is that area of hyaline cartilage where we have very small chondrocytes that are not participating in any uh, bone growth. They're basically just kind of hanging out and being small chondrocytes. Now, sometimes the reserve zone is also called the resting zone. The next zone deep to the reserve zone is the proliferative zone. So now we have chondrocytes that are not only growing but are undergoing mitosis. So we have stacks of chondrocytes that have grown and are developing into more chondrocytes through the process of mitosis. That is known as the proliferative zone because to proliferate means to create more of. Then we have what's known as the zone of maturation and hypertrophy. So these chondrocytes, because we're still dealing with cartilage cells, we started with cartilage cells, chondrocytes. These chondrocytes become larger, older, more mature, and they start to um, accumulate different things inside of them, different lipids, glycogen, alkaline phosphatase accumulate, and the matrix surrounding these chondrocytes starts to calcify. But we don't want calcified cartilage, right? We need calcified bone. So these chondrocytes are getting larger and older. Then we get to what's called the zone of calcified matrix. Now these chondrocytes are dying off and the matrix surrounding them has calcified. So coming up behind them from the metaphysis, because we're growing from the metaphysis toward the epiphysis in the epiphyseal plate. So coming up behind the calcified matrix of dead chondrocytes, we have capillaries bringing osteoblasts in to this area so that the osteoblasts can come in and remove the calcified matrix of the chondrocytes and replace it with osteoblasts that are going to secrete osteoid and that osteoid will surround the osteoblasts. They will turn into osteocytes, which will secrete bone matrix. So I just wanted to take myself off so you can see the, cas the capillaries and osteoblasts are going to come in and secrete bone tissue. That is how longitudinal bone growth occurs. If we only have longitudinal bone growth occurring, our bones would be very thin. So we need a way to make the bones thicker, and that process is referred to as acquisitional.
backbone grow. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, this is a cute little slide. Bone growth continues in length until early adulthood. The skeleton may not completely mature where the epiphyseal plates close and fuse together to form epiphyseal lines um, in different areas of the skeleton, sometimes until the age of 25, and different areas of the skeleton will mature at different rates. Puberty actually signals the closure of growth plates, but it's just the beginning of the closure of growth plates. And chondrocytes, when they stop proliferating and making more of themselves and more cartilage, and when the bone replaces the cartilage, that's when the growth and length will stop and all that is left is a remnant referred to as the epiphyseal line. So let's take a look at how bones become thicker because we just can't have them grow long. They'd be really, really skinny and they wouldn't be able to support us very well. So this is what we refer to as appositional growth or growth in thickness. So with inside the lining of the medullary cavity, osteoclasts will resorb the old lining and create a larger cavity inside as a person is growing. And the osteoblasts are going to produce more bone under the periosteum and remember, they can do that because we have osteoblasts underneath the fibrous layer of the periosteum. So they're going to be laying down more bone on the outside circumference of this bone that was actually developed by endochondral ossification. And that can increase the diameter of both the medullary cavity and the diaphysis. So bone modeling, where we go from an infant to a child to a young adult to an adult, you can see the changes that occur as bones go through this process of modeling. And that creates a growth in thickness known as appositional growth. So length is longitudinal growth, width is appositional growth. Now, bone remodeling continues throughout adult life. So we're constantly replacing old bone with new bone. And that includes a process of bone resorption where osteoclasts break down bone because they contain enzymes that can dissolve it. And then osteoblasts will deposit new bone on that same surface. Now, bone remodeling is actually triggered by stress on bone. There's a law called Wolf's Law that says that stress on bone builds bone. So if there's stress on bone, that's due to mechanical stress from exercise. Exercise That can increase the, um, the overall thickness of the bone. And injury can also cause bone remodeling. We remodel, and different texts will say different percentages. Um, I've seen three to five percent of bone is remodeled annually. Um, some books say five to ten percent. Again, I'm not concerned with the percentage of bone that's remodeled, but just know that you're constantly remodeling your bone, and the shape can also be altered based on stress patterns. <laughs> 